And certainly when we are able to travel and we are not living amidst COVID, giving people opportunities to explore global Jewish values in the international space and really helping them think about how to bring those global values to their local communities. And so with that intro, it's actually like an amazing thing to see three of our TRIP alumni on the call who I'll introduce in a couple of minutes, um, who are actually doing that work locally in organizations or on the ground in their communities. And we're gonna hear from them a little bit about how they've taken those global values into their local communities. So really excited about that. Um, for those of you who do not yet know us, Entwine is the young adult platform of JDC, which is the world's leading Jewish, Jewish humanitarian organization. And we operate in over 70 countries worldwide. Uh, and we're currently focusing a big effort on COVID response and relief, as you might imagine. Uh, Entwine Exclusives, this program, is a weekly series, uh, and it gives people a behind the scenes look at how JDC responds to global issues and global causes and global crises. Uh, and connects you to our leadership and helps you feel engaged in the global Jewish world. So thank you for joining us. Uh, I will just give a little bit of housekeeping tips, as I am sure people are accustomed to now that we've all joined many, many a Zoom call. Um, Ariel Sokoloff, our senior engagement manager, is going to be monitoring the Q&A and the chat on Zoom. So if you have something you want to share there, or if you have a question that comes up for you throughout the session, feel free to throw it in the Q&A section or in the chat. Um, we're also going to have at the end of today's session a designated time for Q&A. So if you throw up a question that doesn't get answered over the course of the next 30-ish minutes, uh, we'll dedicate the last 10 or 15 minutes to Q&A and we'll try to bring your questions into that space. Um, and I'll also be taking a look at it. So if anything comes up that we can weave into some stuff that we're going to be presenting on today, we'll, we'll make sure to uh, weave it into the conversation. Ariel will also be posting links to articles in the chat. So as people mention things throughout the session, you can take a look there and notice um, anything that, that might be, you might want to further explore and, and click on the links and then take them there. Um, so like I mentioned, I'm really excited to highlight three different voices from three different communities um, globally. And these are all three folks who have traveled with us on our alumni, uh, our entwined experiences and are now alumni of our programs. And we're gonna be looking at a few different places and each of them will do an intro on themselves. Uh, but we're gonna look at how LGBTQ plus issues impact youth in today's climate and how they are operating in Israel in today's climate. We're also gonna look at healthcare and take a look at what that looks like. Um, people of color and all of the different ways that these identities merge and coincide, um, especially when we're living in times where things are in flux and uh, there are a lot of unknowns. So I'm thrilled to have uh, alumni from our LGBTQ plus programs, uh, Ron Shalhavi, Rachel Freed, and Joe Levin Manning. I've gotten to travel with two of these folks um, and the other one have spent some time with while I was in Israel last summer. And so just really, really excited to learn from you. And with that, we will jump in. Um, I'm gonna ask each of you actually to share uh, what your entwined connection is uh, and a story or a moment from your LGBTQ plus trip that has impacted you or that you've brought back into your into your local community. And I'm gonna pass it to Rachel to kick us off. Cool. Thank you. Um, and thank you for having me. Um, so I participated in two LGBTQ uh, entwined trips, one to Buenos Aires and Montevideo, and one to Budapest and uh, Berlin. And um, the, the story that inspired me most um, of, of both those trips was that we were in, um, in Montevideo, uh, Uruguay, and there was, um, there weren't a lot of like Jewish queer resources there. And so we didn't visit any Jewish queer um, spaces, but we did go to a day school and um, to a Jewish day school. And one, we weren't really sure how they would, in, how they would react if we talked about LGBTQ things in the Jewish day school in Montevideo. And somebody in our group sort of uh, like brought up at some point in a kind of quiet way, like, do you have any uh, queer students in your school? And there was this one girl who, uh, a high school girl who in front of all these strangers and in front of her administration, like raised her hand and quietly was like, well, actually I'm in the process of coming out. And um, it was a really um, like amazing moment. And for me, I was, I was like shocked by how few resources this kid had um, and how the programming that I had been doing then was basically only in New York. And um, just thinking about like people all around the globe who are, um, in these um, Jewish institutions who are youth who don't have the resources and how we can connect them 
um, and the responsibility that we have to connect them to, to other queer Jewish youth in the world. Thanks. Joe, I'm passing it to you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for having me here. Joe, he, him. Um, so I participated in that same trip with Rachel and Andrew in um, Buenos Aires and in Montevideo. Um, so speaking about our time in Buenos Aires, actually, I remember going to a home and I'm kind of approximate the name was something along the lines of House of the Grandparents, where um, one of the things that they told us was why and how it's important for people to take care of the more vulnerable populations, thinking about the older generation and how a lot of their family is either passing on or they're just so torn with all the other commitments and responsibilities that they have. Um, I remember very clearly like us going in and being a little awkward and trying to like have conversation, but not all of us spoke Spanish and not all of them spoke English. And we were doing crafts together, which was really nice because it gave us something to do to bond. And then um, somehow it got out that I sang. And um, then I remember also singing. And, um, and then the thing that was really nice at the end that I remember is how being that this was a, um, most of, there were people there that were Jewish, both from on our trip, but also there that were residents and getting up and singing Haktifa um, and just like the way that that kind of co connected everyone. Um, and so for me, that is something that I've really carried, carried forward. Thanks, Joe. Ron, you're up. So hi, my name is Ron. I'm very happy to be here and I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. So my English is not going to be so good. So sorry for that, uh, but I, do, I will do my best uh, with my Israeli accent. Um, uh, I was in the last uh, Argentina um, trip uh, with JDC Antoine in last November, just before the corona started. Um, and I think like my moment that really inspired me is the one, the day in the Pride, in the Buenos Aires Pride. I think it was, I'm not thinking, I'm sure that this was my first outside Pride outside of Israel my first pride outside of Israel. And like, I really thought, I, I really, I'm thinking that, you know, our connection worldwide, our like power to be united and to, to, to show like how much we can be um, our fight for equal rights all around the world is, is so powerful and, uh, and it's similar, but it's different. And I don't know, I was very, excited to, to see that outside of Israel and then um, was very a uh, good memory of the trip. Thanks. I think one thing that, that each of you has highlighted in such a significant way in each of your stories is the power of voice. Um, I think what does it mean to actually share your voice, Joe, as you mentioned in, in the old age home? Um, Rachel, what does it mean to actually speak up in an environment where that might not be what is normalized or what people are used to? Um, and Ron, especially at a, a pride celebration, what does it mean to actually raise your voice? And, and one of the things you connected us to in the end was really sharing that voice globally. And what does it mean to connect global communities when we all have a unity around the voice that we actually have when we're pushing equal rights forward? I think it's a really beautiful thing. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I think I'll use that as a segue actually to have each of you tell us um, a little bit about the work that you do and, and why you work in the field that you do and why you've chosen to dedicate your time and your lives to your work. So I think we'll go in opposite order this time. We'll start with Ron and then we'll head to Joe and then um, finish with Rachel. Okay, so I'm working for the Aguda. I'm the vice president in the organization. And why I'm doing that, I will, I will tell you a little bit about the, the organization, but first I want to tell you why I'm doing that. I'm not sure. Uh, I think that, that uh, is, it shows me and not, uh, I think it shows me actually like, I didn't uh, thought I'm going to work in the field of the LGBT community. And I started as a volunteer in the organization and, and I just fall in love in the organization and uh, how much like power of uh, things that we can do to change everybody's life. And like I started on like four or five hours a week and it becomes like very every day and like after three years, I started to work in the Aguda and 
I don't know. I think it, it chose me, and I really love to work here and love to 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 help people like and the LGBT community in Israel. And I'm really glad and I really appreciate this uh, this work. And the Aguda is actually like the oldest organization in Israel. It started in 1975, uh, 45 years ago. Uh, I think not so much like after the American, uh, after Stonewall, like six years after it. Um, and we, ha we have three major areas of activities that we are doing in, in, uh, in Israel, the Aguda is doing. One is lobbying, lobbying and protest. We did like two years ago, like a big uh, strike. I think it was the first LGBTQ strike uh, with hundreds of companies that strike, us, strike with us together. And we did a big protest in Kikarabin in Tel Aviv with 100,000 people. Um, I don't know if you heard about it, but uh, it was very big in Israel. And the second arena is uh, we have support over uh, 50 uh, local communities around Israel, uh, in the north, in the south, 50 local communities. And the uh, third thing is services that we are uh, having to the LGBT community, report center, psychology assistant, a refugee program, helpline, legal department, and uh, more stuff that we are doing in the Aguda. So that's me and the Aguda. Thanks. Joe, you're up. Sure. So um, I'm based out of Washington, D.C., and here I work um, professionally for a um, company called Care First. It's one of the Blue Cross Blue Shields. Um, I'm the advisor to the chief HR officer, and so I get to touch a lot of the different things that we do related to the people in the organization. Um, lately, my life has been really consumed by both COVID, but also the racial injustice that's been happening in the U.S., and so a lot of it's just how do we keep our employees safe when they're working from home and making sure those that do need to come into the office are keeping safe and you know, addressing their needs as those come up in case someone does test positive. But then also what do we as an organization stand for when it comes to trying to address the um, Dispar disparities in terms of how COVID is impacting black and brown people. So that's one part of what I'm doing. And then also looking at um, how are we making in, in a difference in showing up for the black and brown community when we're talking about the pandemic that is police brutality? And then you know, what does this say for us as a company in terms of what kind of um, internalized racism that we have and experience there and how are we trying to address and combat that? And so that um, consumes the, most of my professional life. And then outside of work, I um, helped define this group called Capital Cavellers. It's a, um, a group of LGBTQ young professionals who are Jewish in the greater Washington DC area. So some people up to Baltimore, some in Virginia, and we were founded mostly as a, um, as a way to meet the need of a community that was being underserved in the area. So we are accepting of everyone regardless of gender identity, gender expression. Um, we try to give an alternative so that the people aren't centered around bar culture because obviously there's a um, history of substance abuse and also um, different addictions that uh, um, affect our community. And so we want to make sure that we're creating a space so that everyone can come and partake in um, some kind of safe um, connection. Yeah. Rachel. Cool, thank you. Um, so I am the executive director at JQI, which stands for Jewish Queer Youth. And our mission is that we support and empower LGBTQ Jewish youth with a special focus uh, on those who come from Orthodox, Hasidic, and Sephardi Mizrahi homes. Um, we are a mental health program. So everything that we do comes from the perspective of supporting our youth where they are. Um, our main program that we have is a weekly drop-in center, which um, now we've taken uh, virtual, but um, it's a weekly drop-in center for anyone who's our ages 13 to 23. They can come and meet others like them, um, check in with social workers. Most of the people who come are, are not out, so a lot of them um, are basically out, are only able to be them full, their full selves in, uh, in our JQI space. Um, and a lot of them think that, like, feel like they're the only ones in the world like them until they come into this space, and it's a, it's a room of people who all thought they were the only ones like them in the world before they got there. Um, and I started as a JQI participant, actually. Um, and then I, I, like Ron, became a volunteer, um, which somehow snowballed into uh, the role that I'm in today. 
And I, I grew up Orthodox and um, was closeted for a very long time. And I worked to build the resources that I didn't get to have when I was younger. Thanks. I think the two, the two words that are sitting with me right now, and I'm just going to let them sit without too much um, analysis, um, are support and safety, which you're all doing just incredible jobs. Of, so thank you. Um, I think I'll, actually we should transition into what are some of the challenges that you're seeing now that people have heard a little bit about what your actual work is and what it's like on the ground. I'd love to hear from you. What are the, some of the challenges you're seeing in the queer or LGBTQ plus communities, um, communities of color uh, in the past three months in particular as, as COVID has taken over some of our day-to-day -day lives? And I will let anybody who feels compelled to go first this time jump right in. All right, I'll go for it. Um, okay, so some of the challenges, mean, there have been a number of challenges, as I'm sure is true with um, everybody in different ways. Um, some very JQI specific challenges that we've seen um, are, are, the main challenge that we've seen is that there are so many uh, teens and who are not able to be their full selves and are at home and are stuck at home. Um, and so their youth, they're, they're not out to their families and they're looking for ways to find support and it's really hard to um, be able to find that support when you're not able to speak out loud. Um, for example, you're afraid someone's going to overhear you. Um, you're having to find an excuse for life to get away from your family to be in this whatever Zoom meeting is happening then. So we have a lot of um, people who um, will come to our support meetings and will, instead of talking out loud, will type into the chat box. Um, and, and so it's uh, we have icebreaker questions and people will either answer out loud if they're able to or they'll type in the chat box and we'll read it out loud for them. And we have people who call from sort of like obscure places like from their roof uh, where they're able to get away from their family, uh, hopefully in a, in a safe way, um, or from a car or from somewhere on their block. Um, we also have people who come from more ultra-Orthodox communities who don't have the technology to connect. Um, some of them have what are called kosher phones, um, where there are certain phones that um, have blocked certain access from where, where there are certain keywords or certain websites where, that they are not able to access on their phones. And so we have to create workarounds um, to help them connect um, in different ways than we would normally have someone connect. Um, and we also have a crisis line where Normally people call the crisis line um, and now we're seeing a lot more people text our crisis line so that they can get the support um, without having to speak out loud. Thanks. I'll let Joe and Ron duke it out for who's next. And Joe, you want to go first? Sure. Um, so I think uh, kind of as a way to, to tie in a little bit of what Rachel was talking about, um, mental health is a big thing that is coming up as a um, as a need and a challenge for people just because when we're having d the disruption of doing any kind of elective care or in-person care it does um, impact the quality of care that people are receiving um, some therapists have the capability and some clinics have the capability um, and tools and resources to connect virtually with their clients um, but um, not everyone does and that's both on the provider side but also for the users and so for the patients and so in an age where we're already experiencing an increase of people feeling um, isolated because of the lack of ability to connect in the same social ways, um, you're, you're seeing a rise in um, uh, mental mental health issues, um, including you've been seeing instances of people who are um, experiencing greater um, volumes of domestic abuse or other types of addictions, um, and suicide rates have also um, gone up a little bit. So. Mental health is a huge piece of it, but also thinking more broadly in terms of access to health. You have the other members of the LGBTQ community who might uh, require maintenance medication, whether that be for PrEP, pro, um, which is what the drug that people would take to try and preempt, uh, prevent a HIV status, HIV um, diagnosis rather, and or, you know, hormone maintenance, you know, for someone who's transgender and trying to um, maintain their hormone about their hormone levels but also even if it's just going for the regular testing that people need to make sure that they are um, their HIV is staying in remission or or any other types of services that they might need in person um, which also of course you know affects things like um, gender confirmation um, gender confirmation surgery or other types of legal um, needs that people might need as well as trying to address those concerns um, but also looking at this from the other perspective of this is um, you're seeing a higher rate of unemployment. The 
unemployment rate for LGBTQ people now is around 17, 18%. And so when you see higher rates of unemployment, you also see higher rates of un or underinsured people. And so in terms of already having the barriers to getting access to it just from the books available, but also now having to worry about how are people going to pay for this? Um, while sure, a lot of providers and a lot of companies have said that coronavirus related treatments or testing is going to be free, but that doesn't really help or cover any of the other services that people might need. And so when we're looking at communities of color specifically, this is doubly impactful, um, especially as you're start starting to think about the social determinants of health in terms of people that might be at home challenge or home compromise or don't have access to food. And so just all of these things are combining together and really impacting um, um, certain certain communities more intently than others. Um, yeah, uh, and I think that's just something that we need to be aware of. Thanks. So here is like almost the same, I think. And I think like people, you know, like everyone said uh, before me, and um, people are more alone these days. They have less connection to their nuclear uh, family. And a lot of people don't live in couple as much and don't have many children. And they don't have like the support of the heterosexual family. And, uh, and they are more alone. And because of the coronavirus, they don't have like the places that they used to go to, 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 to have like the chosen family. So I think this is one of the major um, things that we are handling in Israel. Um, another thing, like I want to focus on what Joy is, uh, said like two minutes ago about the unemployment rate. Uh, we see like a very major problem, um, especially on the transgender community, unemployment rate that they have more difficulties to 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 get a job in the first place, and also uh, in the refugee uh, that live in Israel, um, they, they were the first person who. Uh, who got fired from the jobs and they are also in a big, big problem. And um, another thing that we see in the last like couple of months, the, la the last three months, is a little bit increase of the LGBTQ phobia cases that were like near the house, like with your neighbors or with your roommates, you know, when you put a flag on the balcony and the, the and the neighbors are telling you to 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 move it out and there was a little bit of more cases in the area near your house so this is another thing that we handle in these days yeah so a lot of what, what i'm hearing and, and i'll just repeat back a little bit is really about how do you maintain a certain quality of care when you're working with people who have limited resources or who are used to a certain set of resources that have now been um, removed or taken out of the equation. Um, and, and I think that's a really important piece around what does it actually mean to maintain that level of quality as you move through the world. Um, and again, just connecting to what we were talking about earlier in terms of support, really making sure we're meeting people where they're at and giving them the things that are gonna be most useful to them and removing any like barriers or access to entry points so that you can do your work, which you're all doing amazingly well. I wanna get to a little bit about what are some Jewish or global Jewish values that are guiding you right now, but I actually wanted to encourage each of you quickly before we get to that piece to share one bright spot in all of this that you're noticing in your communities. So um, I'll jump in and go first. Um, one of the things that I'm seeing is, uh, at least at work, is a lot of people are motivated and, and feeling empowered to do something to try to impact the community around them. So we have a, um, what we've been doing is we have our food workers, we've been keeping them employed to prepare food for people that are, um, who have, are in food, in food insecure situations, whether that be um, with a certain organization that's going to do donate to them specifically or trying to work with trying to make sure that um, the food banks or other places have the food that they need to help support people. And so that's something I've seen both at, at my job, but also in the community that I'm around. And so that has been really great. Um, for the group that I'm involved with, uh, that I helped to run, Capital Cavaliers, we used to do just monthly in-person dinners, and now we've switched to doing weekly, um, 
weekly happy hours online. And so this has been a really great opportunity for people who were unable to join us because of schedule conflicts or just be the inability to travel on Shabbat because of distance and or resources. And so we've been able to see and reach a lot more people by um, having our resources available in a virtual space. Thanks. Other bright spots, Rachel or Ron? Yeah, um, so I think that um, similarly, there's like a, there's a certain amount of access that, that's now available. Um, even though everybody is so far away from each other, there's sort of this opportunity for connection that wasn't available before. Um, and there are people who now are able to join our drop-in center who weren't able to before. And some of that is because they're geographically far away. So we have people who um, now join us on a regular basis from Israel, England, Brazil, um, and some of those people have never met uh, another Jewish queer person before um, that they were aware of, and now they're able to be part of this community. Um, and some people were not able to join the in-person drop-in center because even though they were in New York, they weren't able to sneak away from their families. Um, so there's someone who's 13 who their parents wouldn't let them um, like travel in, within New York on their own. So they couldn't come to the drop-in center, but now they're able to come um, to come join us um, virtually. And then there's also this component of there's like sort of a safety net in the ability to gradually come out in a Zoom meeting. Um, whereas in person, there's kind of this, uh, either you come into the space or you don't come to the space. So, and there are people who say that they've, um, they've come to the drop-in center and they got to the door and then they left or they came and they walked around the block three times before they were able to like muster up the courage to come inside. And now there's uh, this ability on Zoom to sort of gradually come out where you can, people will have, um, they'll write a different name than the one that they normally go by outside of the drop-in center um, and they'll have their cameras off. And then as they get more and more comfortable, um, you'll, we'll see them like turning on their cameras and writing uh, a different name in the box. And it's, um, there's the there's a uh, there's more safety um, in the ability to come out more gradually and to join the community in a way that in a pace that's comfortable for people, um, which we just didn't have available when it was only in person. We're hoping to continue the virtual drop-in center even far like beyond this time when we're able to have in-person programming again, um, so that we can continue these connections. It's amazing that for for centuries we've tried to figure out how to remove the awkwardness of being a teenager and zoom has solved that problem in so many ways so many ways and also there's still some <laughs> awkward challenges but yes. i'm sure i'm sure i do not uh, envy the teenagers of the world today <laughs> well i'm sure they're lovely but i i don't envy being a teenager uh ron any bright spots in your community that you're seeing so I think like the, the most significant thing is uh, the shifting on the digital part is also Rachel and Joy like uh, connect to that. I think like the major thing that you can be that all the services and all the things, all the activities that like a couple months ago, you couldn't get to it just if you, 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 you just, you had to go to, 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 to have, you have to go to the place, to the, to the, physical place to, to have the, these services. And right now, when it's all on digital and uh, it's all like available, all, no matter where you are, and uh, we did like online seder to around 100 people uh, and we send, and we send uh, food uh, to everyone. And I don't know, like all that, I, I think like we, we're going to maintain that the, the, sh the shifting is not going to return. Like we need to do it both ways also the physical services and also the digital uh, services and i think this is very a uh, bright spot that we need to to maintain it yeah I, I think it's a powerful reflection ron and i think it um from what i'm hearing you say is that um the ability to build community we're learning new definitions for what that looks like and how we're actually going to go about doing it and so whatever we're learning right now is actually really important to hold on to for when we go back to um, our lives in the typical way that we're used to living them. Um, if you can expand your Passover meal, your Passover Seder to more people and bring together yeah. um, larger yeah. and more diverse groups of people into a space, that's going to be a really important learning for us to carry with us when we go back to um, our, our more local and hyper-focused communities. Thanks. Um, so I will, I'm going to, I want to give us time to get to some of the Q&A, um, but want to encourage you all to share a Jewish value or a global Jewish value that's guiding you in this moment right now. 
Rachel, you want to go first? Sure. Um, okay, so the our like philosophy at JQY and the guiding Jewish value at JQY, which is um, also one that I use for myself personally, is that of Elu the Elu, which means um, like literally means both these and those. And it's the idea that there can be um, seemingly conflicting truths that can be true at the same time. Um, and so right now in this specific time, I, there are a number of ways uh, that that applies, but I'm thinking specifically um, like the idea that it's possible to be closeted in your own home and still have pride inside and that you can still be your full self uh, at the same time as not being able to say it out loud. Um, and just also that this is kind of like a, a lonely time where people are sort of disconnected and also at the same time, a time for broadening our connections and for more connection um, in general. So I, I just think the idea of holding different things at the same time that seem like they don't go together, but having them go together, uh, that's my, my guiding Jewish value. Thanks. Joe? Yeah, so there are two things that come to mind. Um, the first of which is um, go seek yourself a teacher and then you make your, you'll find yourself a friend. Um, and I think especially right now where we're in these unprecedented times, these uncharted, this uncharted territory where we are just trying to learn as much as we can both about, well, the two global pandemics that are going on right now. And while it's so easy to get overwhelmed by everything because of all the news that you're seeing, like if you are able to go about it and, um, and understand and learn and really engage in that conversation with someone, you're able to find support as well. And I think that's something that's super critical right now because of how easy it is to be isolated, how easy it is to get overwhelmed and to become overburdened with the, the news that you're seeing. Um, and then the other thing I think about is also the, is, um, the, the quote that is, you are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. This is really a moment for us all to come together and to unite and to try and both combat the racial injustice that we're seeing, but also really combat the risk that people are, are, are facing when it comes to COVID-19. And I'm just really, I would say blessed and I feel like super um, proud of the community that I live in where I see my, the people that I'm interacting with doing the best they can to help um, mitigate the risk that people need to take for these different things, whether that's um, providing food and or um, you know, delivery or just even talking to someone online. And so just that's kind of what's really guiding me right now. Thanks. Ron? I think also community responsibility. Um, mm. um, I think this is what the means of community, of Jewish community and also LGBTQ community, to be there for each other, and uh, I saw like uh, even independent activities for people to help each other, to, to, to bring food to each other and to help wh whatever they need. And there is like a lot of WhatsApp uh, messages and uh, WhatsApp groups. Like if you need something, I, I think in these days, you're going to get it. And people like are willing to, to give a lot more. And I think uh, I saw in the last three months, People like want to, to, to be there for each other. Thanks. All right, so we are gonna head to some audience Q&A. Uh, don't, you don't have to all answer every question if you don't want to or if you don't uh, have a contribution to that question, but I'll read some off and whoever feels like they wanna weigh in on that question, feel free to, to jump into the conversation. Um, so our first question that came in was, how has the current protest movement impacted your personal goals uh, and your goals for queer Jews in the work that you do? You can say again the question, please. Uh, so the question is really about the current protest movement, all the protests that are happening globally and how it's impacted your, your personal goals in the way that you um, activate your sense of activism, um, but also the goals that you have for queer Jews. Um, yeah, so I th think it's a great question. Um, so for, for me, one of the things that's been really challenging is trying to manage the, the health risk involved in going out and protesting, being, um, being in a high risk category, but also at the same time, that inner Jewish like yearning to being out there standing and trying to fight for justice, um, both as a person of color in the, in the US, but also just because I believe it's our right as queer Jews, our responsibility as queer Jews to go out there and do that. Um, 
one of the things that I've done is I've really done, I've uh, been really um, great and fortunate enough to donate to organizations in the community that are able to provide the resources for people who are going out there and, pro um, and protesting. So um, one of the local organizations here was collecting money to provide snacks and water to try and make sure that the people out there are staying hydrated. And um, one of the things that my group has done has been to really, um, has been to post resources in our newsletter that goes out saying, here's how you can learn more about what you can do. And then making sure to connect people to access testing afterwards, because it's um, super important when you put yourself out there to get tested afterwards. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see in the next couple of days, the results of that, those tests, since now we should be able to see the effect of if that caused any additional spread. But um, but I think this is a great opportunity for us to stand up. And as I wrote in the, in the piece that, I, that was shared earlier, um, there are so many ways for us to get involved. There's no reason for us to sit on the sidelines. Um, if you can't go out and protest, donate. If you can't donate money, donate your time. If you can't do that, then you know educate yourself, educate others. There's so many ways to get involved. And I just want to continue to see our community get more involved. I think we've done a great job so far. And I think that there's so much more that we can do and so much more, um, so much further to go. Thanks. So one of the questions that came in actually uh, is connected to something that you actually said earlier, Joe, uh, when you shared your Jewish value about not, um, not you don't have to complete the task, but neither are you free to desist. And the question here, which seems to link up really nicely to that is what advice do y'all have for allies who wanna help? You know, we all play a part and a role. So what is the role of allies uh, in this moment to be helping? There are so many things going through your heads that uh, that that we can't just pick one role for allies to play right now. But if you could pick one or two, we'd love to hear about them. Um, okay, I have um, some thoughts. Um, I think that having conversations and sharing resources that are like considered to be like taboo um, is so important and speaking up and sharing and publicizing um, even if you think that something has been said over and over and over again uh, because you never know who's listening and who needs to hear what you're saying um, and i also think that there's this um like specifically from people who are queer youth who come from orthodox communities i've seen that there's this like uh, a type of empathy that is um, more obvious, I think, where there's like a, an understanding of systemic discrimination that maybe others um, don't have so, uh, that's not as obvious to them. Um, because when you grow up as part of a system where everything's not made for you, um, you can sort of take that idea and move it over into another system where everything is not made for somebody else. And so um, this idea of like taking the, our own, um, the way that we see things ourselves and, and being able to use that as empathy to see how other things work um, is something that I've seen a lot of. Um, and I think it's, it's almost like for the youth that we work with, it, it, there are people who sort of have a hard time understanding um, how there are people who don't understand systemic discrimination. Um, and that's something that, um, sort of that goes back to the question beforehand, but um, that's something that I'm taking um, in the work that I do um, from my own personal self and for working with other courageous. Beautiful, having empathy and going into conversations with an open mind and also not making assumptions about people's knowledge or what they might know and using moments like these to learn with each other and educate each other, beautiful. Joe, I saw you unmuted, so I'm gonna pass it to you. Yeah, I, um, I think to echo and to kind of further what Rachel is saying, um, definitely educating yourself so that you can demonstrate that empathy. But part of the education should also be centering the voices of the people that are being affected by this situation. Um, you know, it's Pride Month. And so obviously, there's so many resources out there to learn about the discrimination and the ways that the LGBTQ community are being impacted. But you know, as you're thinking that that logic goes to any type of community that you're trying to be an ally to, make sure that you're listening to and looking for voices from the people from inside that community. Um, I, I have a friend who I see on Facebook all the time say, oh, I'm not going to repost this article I saw written by a white person. I'm going to repost this article I saw written by a black person because of the fact that you should hear their experience. And that's something that has really, really resonated with me as I've grown up and learned how to be a better ally. And so um, whatever group you're trying to be an ally for, I try to make sure that you're looking for the, the voice from that group as opposed to the voice of someone else on behalf of that group. 
Beautiful. Ron, I want to give you a chance in our, in our last two minutes, if there's anything um, that you have as advice for allies, especially in the Israel community. Um, we had uh, three elections the last, I think, year. And the last <laughs> election was on, um, I think, February, when the corona started. And I think, like, the major thing that the major um, thing that I want the allies will do is to just to, to be with us. And even this, in this difficult time when the no conversation about any other subject than the coronavirus, that also like they will have our voice also. It's like to, 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 to think about this is maybe it's not related to them, but we are part of them and we are part of the society. And, uh, and uh, I don't know, maybe to, 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 to to listen to us and to to even in these difficult times to to stay still open. Beautiful, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna officially close us out and say thank you. As you were all talking about your Jewish values, I was trying to think what is something that guides me in the work that I do and the way that I think. Um, and one of my favorite Jewish texts that I'll offer as a as a closing for today is about when the Israelites, the people in the community, were. Um, tasked with bringing their first fruits, their first harvests to the temple. Um, and what would, what would happen at the temple is that everybody would be required to read a blessing or an offering to actually um, give their fruits to the temple. And someone notices in the course of that interaction that not everybody can read. And so I think one of our tasks is what do we do when we encounter people who don't have the skills or resources or time or, or any number of things or who are marginalized um, don't have the resources. And the response in that Jewish text is to not require people to read in order to make that offering to the temple, but rather that the leader will read the blessing and everybody will repeat after them. And as I listen to you all, I'm inspired by the work that you're doing to remove those barriers, to not require people to be literate, to get involved, um, but to really give them access points and ways to enter the community on their own terms and in ways that mean the most to them without requiring them to have um, um, something that they need to enter. So thank you for that. Um, thank you to our panelists, to Rachel, to Joe, to Ron for teaching us today. It's just amazing to, to hear your expertise in the field and about all the work that you're doing. Um, also gonna share a thank you with our audience. Thank you for joining us. It's really, really special to see how many people come and listen to these and kind of spaces and want to learn. Um, and then I'll just share a few things coming up with Entwine. Um, we have an amazing alumni spotlight from Matthew Nouriel, who is one of our community representatives and has been on a few trips with us. Um, and you can see that on our Facebook page, and I know Ariel will share that in the chat as well. Um, this Friday, we're partnering with JQ uh, in Los Angeles on a Pride Shabbat, so we hope that you will join us for that. Um, and then this month's off-the-shelf Entwine virtual book club is actually LGBTQ focused, um, and we're learning about Wapa, um, the novel by Sophie Haddad about a gay man living in an Arab land. So I hope you'll join us for that. And for future Entwine Off the Shelf uh, Global Book Clubs, next month we're, we're focusing on Cuba. So we'd love to have you come and learn about that. Everything, all of this information, all of our programs that we're offering can be accessed on the thread Entwine's virtual meeting space for young Jewish and adults. Um, and Ariel just put it in the chat as well, jvcentwine.org slash the thread. Um, Thank you again for coming. I hope everyone stays healthy and safe, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye.